now. Um, hi, everybody. I am Tara. I am, work here at ASM. I apologize. Uh, Kathy is unable to join us today due to unforeseen circumstances, um, but we'll be back next week for Jed's second session on um, social skills training. Um, Jed has Jed is, a, is pretty amazing. Um, he has done a, a fall conference for us a couple years ago in Bangor, which I believe some of you have attended. Um, and he is head of the social skills training program, which serves individuals um, with autism spectrum disorder, as well as social and emotional challenges. Um, he is the author of nine books, um, about social skills and social skills training. And he's also been featured on ABC News and Nightline. Um, and also has some wonderful resources and videos on YouTube that uh, are really great for parents, teachers, anybody to kind of check out if you have a have a few minutes. They, uh, they are, it's really a great resource for you. So I am going to introduce uh, or let Jed come on and get things going. And um, hi, Jed. I'm just Hello. gonna disappear and let you let you go. Um, questions in the chat box. Uh, those will be great, and we will uh, also check on Facebook Live for any questions that come through there. Um, I will have the handouts. I will put that into the chat box so you can download them. If you do not get them. Uh, follow-up email will have an email address so you can uh, request your contact hours and the handouts as well. So go ahead, John. It's, it's all you. Great. Thanks so much. And I assume you'll let people in as we're, as we're talking. Yep. And um, make, let's make sure everyone hears me okay. If, if people don't, uh, uh, well, you'll let me know, right? Absolutely. All right. Um, and here's the deal, guys. I'm going to try to stop around 315-ish to take your questions about particular situations you're dealing with. Uh, any question is fine. Um, but I'm going to follow the chat room as we speak so that if you have a question about something I just said, I'm happy to answer that. If it's about you know a situation you're dealing with, we'll wait to the Q&A for that. Um, so you can see what I'm talking to you about today compared to next week. Today is really about all the sort of challenging behaviors um, and both sides of one coin. You know, when people get threatened, they can become angry and have outbursts or they can turn inward with anxiety and depression. And we're going to talk about both um, today, uh, particularly about those on the spectrum, but, but, but everybody really. So uh, I want to start with a message of hope. Um, certainly, you know, in light of the pandemic, I think we all need sort of that message of hope. But I always start with a message of hope because there's some really good research that hope leads to better outcomes when working with kids. That if you get teachers and parents to have a more hopeful attitude, um, that it, there's a shift in what they do to sort of affect better outcomes. So we're going to talk about that. But uh, first, let's start with like the hope that all of us need where, where you are, as Fauci has said, you know, the five yard line perhaps, right? So, I mean, when I started doing these talks a year ago during the pandemic, um, things were pretty bleak, but uh, boy, you know, the data on the vaccines look actually pretty good. And um, I've been vaccinated myself and, and now able to do some things that I couldn't do before. Um, so if we can kind of hang in there, uh, get through uh, the, the little the peaks and jumps that we're gonna have in cases, I think we're gonna be pretty good if we do what we're supposed to do. But again, I want to talk to you about the hope that has to do with better outcomes with kids. Um, here's what I want to talk to you about, and then we'll get right into that sort of research on hope. When we understand difficult behavior in the right way, when we're, ha when we're having these moments with our students, our clientele, we are going to get better outcome. Um, one of the things about sort of understanding why kids are having these difficult moments or adult clients for that matter, um, when we understand it in a good way, it also helps us to be chill and not to be reactive, right? When we take it personally and we feel attacked, we tend to react and sometimes that just makes it worse. So our goal is to be chill. If we can be chill as a provider, meaning a parent or professional, I assume I might have both in the audience uh, as I am both. Um, if we're chill, we can help somebody else be chill. So we'll talk a little bit today about the art of de-escalation, sort of talking people off the ledge, just calming them down when they're in a meltdown. How do we, you know, it's really the art of distraction and soothing. 
Um, but that's not all we want to do. We really want to get to the bulk of our talk is about setting up prevention plans. So when the same kind of meltdowns keep happening, we've got to learn what the triggers are. And when we know what the trigger is, we're in a good position to prevent the problem. So I'm going to lay out for you seven very common categories of triggers, kind of a map, if you will, for you to have in your head. So you can ask that question, oh, was this the trigger? Was this the trigger? Because when you know what the trigger is, as I kind of write in my uh, No More Meltdown book, you can go to the right prevention plan. Ah, okay, here's some ideas how to handle that kind of situation. Let's talk about hope. How does hope lead to better outcome? One of my uh, early mentors and then later co colleagues, uh, uh, Mark Durand, Dr. Mark Durand, when I was up at the University of Albany in New York, um, he, was, he wrote a book called Optimistic Parenting, and he was doing research on what predicts aggressive behavior among children with autism. And uh, he assumed that if they were really aggressive at three, that would be the best uh, predictor of how aggressive at home they'd be at six. But it wasn't the best predictor. Um, then he thought, well, maybe if they can't speak, their language is uh, challenged, uh, they're less verbal, they're going to be more frustrated. That was slightly predictive of aggression because if you can't talk, you get frustrated. But the best predictor was parental optimism or hope. When parents had hope that their kids could get better, they kept doing the things to try to help improve the situation. When people lose hope, progress halts. Hope is a necessary, it's not sufficient, but it's a necessary component. And what it means to have hope, and what I teach all my teachers and my parents is when a horrible behavior is in front of you, we say that behavior is temporary, it's not a forever behavior. You know, um, it, it doesn't have to be forever. You know, maybe a, a diagnosis of autism can be forever, although for some it's not. Um, but certain behaviors don't have to be forever. And it's often a specific behavior that's missing. There's a skill that we can teach. It's not that there's a character flaw. Like we do have kids who are easily dysregulated, who maybe uh, are born with a more difficult temperament, but that doesn't mean they can't learn to be patient, learn to wait for things, learn to accept no or handle change. We can teach those skills. It's a specific behavior, not a personality problem. And the last issue is, um, we don't uh, want to sort of blame the kid for the problem and say, you know, they're doing this on purpose to drive me crazy. That just makes us angry. Then we get mad and we escalate the problem when we take it personally. The best way to define the problem when there's a very challenging behavior is there was a gap between the demands placed on that individual and their ability to cope. And that means that tells us how to intervene. We alter the demands or we teach a better way to cope. And that's what therapy is. How do I teach this youngster a better way to handle things? So guys, this first page is about making sure everybody on the team that works with your child, or your adult client, or your kid client, or whoever you have, everybody's on the idea, uh, has the same concept that these difficult moments are temporary. There's a specific missing behavior. We can teach that skill. There's a gap between the demands we placed on that individual and their coping skills. So we might need to modify the demands and teach better coping skills. And that brings us to this issue of discipline versus educating. I often hear from parents and teachers, you know, they just need good rules. They just need good boundaries. And I'll tell you who that works really well for well-regulated logical kids. Logical, well-regulated kids understand that if they misbehave, if they curse, they throw things, they bite, they smack, they do whatever, that, that something bad might happen. They might lose their iPad time or their TV time or something might happen, right? They get that. And, uh, and if you follow and you hold firm to the boundaries, it helps them maybe. But for kids who get dysregulated a lot, maybe they have a, a severe ADHD or intermittent explosive disorder, or they have an anxiety or mood disorder, bipolar disorder, or, or they're you know, on the spectrum and having some mood dysregulation issues. Um, sometimes the punishment actually just makes things worse, as many of you parents and teachers know. It can be an escalating power struggle. And so what we it doesn't mean we can't start with limits, but when that doesn't work or it makes it worse, we have to stop and ask the question, why is this happening? What is the trigger? How do I modify the trigger, the demand? How do I change the demands we're placing on this individual to make life a little easier? And how do we teach him or her a better way to cope? What skills do we have to teach?
right? So we educate them, teach them a better way to handle it rather than punish them, right? We, we educate, not incarcerate. Educate, not incarcerate. Um, and so that brings us to understanding what's going on, right? When kids and adults get dysregulated. So part of what's going on is they have a limbic system reaction, what I call the Incredible Hulk. So we have two parts of our brain uh, that I wanna describe here. Uh, the limbic system is uh, controlling our sort of automatic survival instincts when we feel threatened, we're ready to fight, flight, or just sort of shut down and freeze till the coast is clear, hide out, you know? fight, flight, or freeze. That's what the limbic system does. That's our incredible hulk. We need it. If a car is coming to hit us, we don't want to think about it. We don't want to reflect on it. We just want to run the heck out of there so we don't get hit. That's what the incredible hulk and the limbic system do. But this other part of our brain, the forebrain, what I like to call Dr. Banner, to carry over this Marvel Comics analogy, Dr. Banner is the logical part of the brain that helps us reason and plan and figure out how to solve a novel problem, something we didn't know how to deal with, something new, we, we, we figure it out. Um, well, what happens is when we are uh, threatened enough, the limbic system can hijack the rest of the brain, right? Dr. Banner goes away. There isn't the scientific logical brain anymore. It's just a reptilian hulk, you know, who comes out and just is ready to fight, run, or, or hide. And those are the problems we see with our kids. And so this is an emotional dysregulation that can be rageful or can be anxiety, depression. Fight is rage. Uh, flight or freeze is often anxiety or depression. So uh, when you have a youngster who's been diagnosed with uh, uh, a severe ADHD or bipolar disorder or severe anxiety or mood disorder, Somebody's saying they're having trouble regulating their limbic system. So what helps the Incredible Hulk, right? Um, you've seen the movies, guys. Have you seen the movies? What helps the Incredible Hulk? Put it in your chat box. Tell me what or who helps the Incredible Hulk. Anybody want to say? Type it in your chat box. You watch the movies, watch the shows. That, first of all, let me ask you this. Jane helps them. Yeah, I think that's her name. Scarlett Johansson is the actress. I think in the morning, I'm going to see some kids like, so how do I become Scarlett Johansson? A trusted, attractive actress from a previous episode that, you know, doc, that the Incredible Hulk trusts, right? How do I become an attractive ingenue from a previous episode? That's how, that's how you gain trust, right? Is to, is to be somebody that made, made the Hulk feel good in the past. Um, what doesn't help the Hulk is threatening to shoot him because then he just eats your gun. Uh, so let's talk about when people are in that Hulk mode, limbic system, hijacked by their emotions, what I like to call a meltdown, right? Um, what doesn't help is to threaten them. Sometimes we back away. So I got two kids in my class. You know, I'm not doing this work. It's stupid. I hate you. I hate this. And the other kid next to him is not a kid who's usually sort of the incredible Hulk but he's friends with the other kids. So he's acting like that too, just to imitate him. Yeah, yeah, I'm not doing this work either. Well, the kid who's kind of calm, I can go right up to him and be firm. Hey man, you gotta, you gotta do the work right now. Do I need to call your mom? And that'll work for him. He needs a little tough love, but the kid who has a history of being the incredible Hulk, if I get up in his face, you need to do the work now. Do I need to call your mother? Guess what? He's gonna spit in my face. He's gonna yell. He's gonna run out of the room into the street, or he's just gonna shut down, fight, flight, or freeze. If why is he the incredible Hulk? Because he felt threatened, maybe, maybe by the work. And now if I get you need to do the work now, I'm threatening him more. So we're just going to get more Hulk behavior. So first order of business, nonverbal skills to increase safety mean without saying a word, maybe I just back away. I'm not in his face. You know, I got, I got some work to do here. Let me know if you need my help. Right. I get away. Listen, agree, and apologize can be de-escalating. So he's in the middle of my class, he hit that other kid. And uh, I'm usually like out, you know, not to hit. There's a rule here, go to the principal. But if I take the time to listen, what happened? He tells me, well, the other kid took the last cupcake for our cupcake party. Just listening to his side of the story is de-escalating. He's getting his day in court. Agree with the kernel of truth that he's talking about. Like, you're right, you're right. 
Say those words. You're right. He shouldn't have taken that cupcake. Now, it's not okay to hit him, but you're right. He shouldn't have taken that cupcake. Apologize. I'm so sorry he took that, right? I, it's not my fault, right? But I'm apologizing to show sympathy. Listen to Green apologize, de-escalating. And then the next issue is to collaborate, right? If there's still a little Dr. Banner left in there, I say, uh, what, what is therapy? Therapy is teaching a kid a better way to get what he wants. So in the middle of his meltdown, I'm saying, hold on, like, I hear you want to hit him and kill him and all that, but tell me if I'm wrong. You wanted a cupcake, right? I can help you get a cupcake. Let's do it the right way. Hitting him is not going to get you the cupcake. By the way, the cupcake he took was rock hard, nasty, stale, gross cupcake anyway. Let me help you get a better cupcake, but you got to work with me. Or it's a nonverbal kid kicking, screaming, and yelling. And to collaborate and to ask him what he wants, I use my choice board, my picture board. And I have pictures of different things. Do you want your snack? Do you need a break? Do you need to do another activity? And I try to give him another way to communicate what he wants. And so sometimes all of that works if Dr. Banner's left there. But if I have a complete incredible Hulk where I try to use the picture board with my less verbal kid or my verbal kid, I try to say, hey, I can get you a, a, a cupcake. And, and he's like, I don't care. I'm going to kill him anyway. When you have the full blown Hulk in front of you, then what you're trying to do is uh, you're in crisis mode. And when logic is gone, we use distraction as our crisis tool. And so what is distraction? It's a way to get your mind off the thing that's triggering the limbic system. I can't use logic anymore. I can't try to convince or persuade. I just try to get your mind off of it. So I have three categories of ways to distract kids that I think about. One, novel items, things they've never seen before. So I come over with my gold coin and I, and I, from Slovenia, where I, I did a talk not so long ago, well before the pandemic. I said, did I ever show you these gold coins from Slovenia? Do you want to see? Check this out. I think it's worse. On, he'd never seen it before. That might get his mind off of it for a second. Or special interests is the next category of distraction. So maybe... This kid is a Pokemon fan and I bring out all my Pokemon cards and we talk about what they're worth and you know what's a good card, what's not, um, and that distracts them. Or a sensory activity. So what does that mean? It could mean listening to a mindfulness meditation app, listening to music, going for a walk. It could be giving a snack. A snack is an incredible taste and food is an incredibly powerful sensory experience that changes the mood very rapidly of people. So does music, by the way. You know, music is one of those weird things that has a very powerful immediate effect on mood and doesn't have the kind of side effects that drugs have. Um, and so that's uh, another powerful sensory kind of um, uh, a shift. Um, so that's distraction. Some of you out there who are trained in behavioral techniques will say, but aren't you rewarding a tantrum? If a kid's having a meltdown and you then bring over a, like, let's listen to some nice music or, and you do something nice to soothe them, aren't you rewarding a tantrum? Well, sometimes you might be, if they're trying to get out of their homework or classwork, they're trying to avoid something. And when they scream and yell, you let them watch SpongeBob. Then they learned I yell and scream to get SpongeBob. So what I'd rather do is teach them a better way to ask for a break. You don't have to yell or scream. You can say, I need a break. Then we'll watch SpongeBob for five minutes. So uh, we can do that or we can reduce the demand. So if they had five sentences to write for homework, was, let's just do one. I'm going to start it for you. Let's get it. And then we'll take a break. So we reduce the difficulty. So when someone's trying to avoid something, we don't just reward the tantrum and, and, and you know, give them the break when they're tantruming. We try to teach them to request the break or we simplify the work, and then we take a break. Um, but a lot of the time, it's not about avoiding work. Like a kid is upset because they didn't get a candy bar at the supermarket. And if I just have them listen to their favorite song and that distracts them, that's not rewarding them for a tantrum rewarding them would have been you know to to give in and give them the candy bar or to go to every store looking for the candy bar they want but instead i get their mind off of it that's a good example to show you you don't have to punish kids sometimes it's okay to soothe and calm right regulate them um and that brings us you know to the bigger issue we can't just be sort of 
putting out fires after the fact all the time with crisis management. What we really want to do is get to the point where we can, you know, understand what's setting them off and then set up a good prevention plan to modify those triggers, teach them a better way to cope. How do we get ahead of it, right? So behaviorists have a term called a functional behavioral assessment where they're trying to understand the function of the behavior. Basically, the why is why are they doing that? question. And to do that, they follow what they call the ABCs of behavior, antecedent behavior consequence. English translation, the before, during, after of the problem behavior, like what happened before? What was the trigger? And what happened afterwards? Do people just give him whatever he wants when he screams and yells? Or does he get a lot of attention for that? What happens, right? My focus is less on the function of the behavior. I was trained as a behaviorist, but my focus is really on identifying triggers because the trigger is the first link in the chain and is rich with the information you need to know how, what to modify, right? If someone wants to avoid work, I know that maybe teaching him a functional replacement like asking for a break is a good idea, but I need to know what they're avoiding because if they're avoiding certain types of writing assignments, then, I, then it gives me an, a, an idea of like what I need to modify, okay? So I'm looking for those triggers. I'm going to show you a list of triggers. I'm just going to say my No More Meltdown book is also an app that you can get on your smartphone, and it'll um, allow you in real time to keep track of um, difficult behaviors as they occur, and you can upload it to a website called simtrend.com, and, and I can put that in the chat here. Um, here let me see. Yeah, somehow can't. Uh, Oh, here we go. Simtrend.com. Anyway, it'll uh, analyze the sort of triggers that were setting your kid off for the last couple of weeks, depending on what you're putting into your phone as problems occurred. And then it'll steer you to the right prevention plan for my No More Meltdowns book. Okay. Um, it's, it's all easier to do the detective work of like, what is the trigger? if I give you a list of triggers. So here's a list of common triggers. It's not a exhaustive list. These are the major categories of triggers that I see set off kids. And I've underlined and highlighted those of which I think are particularly important during this pandemic because they're exaggerated during a pandemic. But let's go over the first one, internal issues. When a kid is really hungry or tired or not feeling well, or they have psychological grief issues and things that, you know, a trauma that's occurred, they're having more problems everywhere they go. Like there's something inside of them that's bothering them and they take a higher level of irritation or depression or upset everywhere they go. And so you tend to see that the problem is not just in a particular classroom or at school versus home. It's like everywhere they go. And so then you wonder, okay, you have to ask what's going on. Um, like especially for less verbal kids who can't tell you that might be they have a headache or sinus infection as allergy season is coming up or dental pain or whatnot. They can't always tell you. So sometimes if there's a higher level of problem, we've got to evaluate, is there something going on internally? And it means we probably have to lower the demands we're placing on them for a little while to figure out what the issue is because we may not be able to solve it immediately. Um, so, uh, that's one thing we got to look for. Another category of triggers. Um, oh, and by the way, a good example of this was a kid who like, it was a Canadian kid I was working with a um, uh, school up in Canada. And the issue was that the kid wouldn't get on the bus in the morning. He had a lot of meltdowns, and, but not every day, but often. And when we tracked it, it turned out that when he didn't want to get on the bus, it was usually um, the night before he hadn't gone to sleep. He had trouble falling asleep. So he got up late. And as a result of getting up late, he also missed breakfast. So these, these significant issues on the bus were associated with a tired kid who hadn't eaten. And so there was a relatively simple solution to the food part of that. Um, and then we eventually were able to solve the helping him get to sleep at night part. Um, so that's one thing to look for. Another issue with this kid is the second category, sensory issues. Um, what a lot of noise there was on that bus. And that was another reason not to want to be on the bus. It was hot. It was noisy. We got permission to open the windows. We got permission to use noise canceling headphones and that helped him on, on the bus. Um, 
Another sensory issue is understimulation. Kids with ADHD can't just sit and be talked at the way I'm talking at you. They need lots of hands-on activities to do, lots of breaks. Um, so we've got to look uh, when the kids are having trouble or adults for that matter, if there's a boredom issue or there's overwhelming stimulation issue, and we, can, and we all have to alter those things. Lack of structure often means <clears throat> a lack of sort of visual support as to what's going on. Um, kids with autism, kids with ADHD often need sort of a visual schedule to know what's happening. Now, this is a real major issue during the pandemic when they used to have a very scheduled day at school. And then if they're home, it's not as clear what the schedule is. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about adding that visual support and schedule and structuring uh, things so that um, people know what's expected. Uh, anxiety can lead to more problems. So visual schedules reduce anxiety. It lets somebody know, you know what may be happening, okay? Challenging work or feared situations. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, phobias and fears. I wrote a book called Overcoming Anxiety. So we'll talk a little bit about that, especially with regards to the pandemic. Um, but also academic frustration, right? Fear of academic work. Kids who feel stupid if they can't do things or, or their frustration tolerance is so little when they, get, they don't know how to do things and they just quickly get angry. So let, we're going to talk about that as a major trigger. Having to wait or not get what you want. A disappointment. Those are major triggers. So kids who have trouble waiting or, or there's a change in schedule, so they expect it to go outside um, and play, and it happens to be raining out today, so we can't play outside, and we get a meltdown, right? So how do we handle those things? We'll talk about that. Then the last two um, are threats to self-esteem. So this means things that make people feel immediately bad about themselves. So for some kids, losing a game or being corrected or making a mistake with their work makes them feel like a loser, makes them feel bad, being criticized, being teased. So I'm going to show you how we help them handle those insults to their self-esteem and, and, and shore up their self-esteem, how to think about it differently so it's less likely to trigger them. Uh, and the last one is unmet wishes for attention. So kids who need a ton of attention and when they don't get it, that's when they act out. Their mom's on the phone and that's when the kid is grabbing at her and all that, um, you know, or kids who think that, uh, they, that, you know, they've made other kids laugh before by saying like a curse word or something. And so now that's all they do all the time is say provocative stuff um, because it gets one person to laugh, but the rest of the people are annoyed with them. So let, we'll talk about that as well. Those are some major categories. Um, when you know what the trigger is, a good behavior plan is about altering the trigger, altering the demand and teaching a better way to handle the trigger. Those first two things are proactive things we can do. Right. The third and fourth things are what we do after the fact. We'll reward the new replacement skill, the better way to handle the difficult situation. And number four, I just want to avoid loss systems with the Incredible Hulk. But occasionally we have someone who's dysregulated, not with Hulk like emotions. They're just silly and giddy. They're like, uh, you know, a stand up comedian um, who's like a little too happy and too uninhibited. And that's a kid that you might be able to say, you know, if you say that again, you know, you're going to lose a little iPad time or something like that. But I don't want to do that to the Incredible Hulk. We don't want to add fire to fire. Okay. So I'm not going to explain what the coronavirus is. You know what it is, but we have had to explain it to kids, including those who are nonverbal, less verbal. And so the Autism Society of America's major, you know, national website has a nice link that I put up here to a picture story that explains a little bit about the virus and the need to wear a mask or stay far apart and wash your hands, etc. cetera. Um, the issue is once you tell people about the virus, the kids, adults, you know, there's fallout. They get worried that they will get sick or their family member will get sick. They may know somebody or in their family who did get sick. Maybe they did. Um, there's frustration over not getting to do what they used to do, all the restrictions. They can't uh, go to places they used to, to go. Their programs are canceled. Special Olympics is, is, is modified. You know, I have a lot of adult clients I'm working with. You know, they, they're not even in their group homes anymore. They had to go home, back to live with their uh, aging parents and are really frustrated not to be with their peer group, you know? So we're going to talk about some of these. Um, 
let's talk about anxiety first. How do we handle anxiety? Uh, so, you know, look, the goal of dealing with anxiety is if you have a unrealistic fear, Realistic fears are good. If you're not vaccinated, you shouldn't be breathing in people's face in a large crowd. Not a good plan. That's a realistic fear. But as I'll show you in this uh, example I'm going to give you here, we had a kid who wouldn't go out of his house, maybe even out of his room for fear of getting COVID. And that's an unrealistic worry. Like if you're outside six feet away with a mask, he, he's pretty safe, especially if it's not a you know congested area. And so we wanted him to get out and, move and do things, you know, uh, particularly outside. So when you have unrealistic fears, whatever they are, the goal is what we call gradual exposure, gradually facing the fear to discover nothing bad will happen, to train your brain to realize, see, you went out and you did it and nothing bad happened. Um, how do we get people to do that? First thing is we educate them uh, that that anxiety or fear that they have might be what we call a false alarm. That is, we have, you have an incredible Hulk uh, alarm system in your body, keeps you safe, cars coming to hit you, the incredible Hulk kicks in, alarm, alarm, danger, danger, and it makes you run. But sometimes we have false alarms where our body goes danger, danger, and it really isn't a danger. And the trick about COVID uh, and the pandemic is unfortunately your panic symptom, that fear response, that alarm reaction really mimics some of the symptoms of COVID. So early on in the COVID pandemic, um, I would get very anxious uh, and um, my heart would beat uh, fast. Uh, I might lose my breath for a second. And uh, then I start to wonder, oh, do I have COVID? Uh, those are some of the symptoms of COVID, type, type feeling, couldn't breathe, but I got an oximeter um, and I was able to see my oxygen was fine. So, okay, that was good. And, uh, and then um, my heartbeat went down again. Oh, I see, this is anxiety, good. So the education helped me, right? Um, the next issue is to learn to think like a scientist. So whenever you have any worry, whatever it is, and my book, Overcoming Anxiety, talks about different anxiety disorders from OCD to you know, a panic disorder and to fear, simple phobias, fear of insects outside, things like that fear of going to the doctor, fear of a needle, all these things. But whatever the fear is, um, when you have a relatively verbal kid, what you're doing is you're helping them to think like a scientist to evaluate the evidence of their fear. Because we explain to them that false alarm that they're having is like a propaganda fake news channel in their brain spewing out you know, uh, scary information. And you need to evaluate, well, is that true? Is this real? And so what do scientists do? They evaluate it and we ask two questions to help them think like a scientist. Are you overestimating the probability of something bad happening? And are you overestimating the severity? So um, what we do when we answer those questions is we create a think like a scientist cue card. And this is a card that we created for the kid who didn't wanna go out of his room or even go outside of his house um, for fear of getting COVID. And, uh, we sort of looked up what the CDC and what the best scientific data had said to us that if he stayed six feet away with a mask outside, the risk is extremely low. Of course, if he gets vaccinated, it's going to be even lower. Um, he was afraid. So he was overestimating the severity of getting COVID. I mean, the probability of getting COVID if he's to follow the, the guidelines. He was also overestimating the severity. He figured if I get COVID, he'll die. And when you look at the research um, for different age groups, certainly early on in the pandemic, young kids are at very, very low risk compared to older folks. Um, and so he was way overestimating the severity. So we use this think like a scientist to try to help him to, oh, oh man, I didn't show it to you. Well, I'm going to tell it to you. We created a fear ladder and a fear ladder was uh, these different situations where we asked him to stand by the front door for a couple of seconds, and then he would get a reward for doing that. And he'd find out he didn't get COVID, right? Next day, we have him stand um, by the door and open the door. You can put a mask on, open the door. You know, a couple of days go by, he doesn't get COVID. Um, 
and I, obviously it takes some weeks for that. Um, but um, if he's overcoming that fear, we try to keep him doing this each day. Uh, go outside for a minute with a mask on. Next step on the ladder was go outside for five minutes. So this is called gradual exposure. And ultimately we got him to actually go out for, you know, take a walk for an hour outside. Um, we were debating whether we wanted him to go into a grocery store with his parents to get food because there was some actual real risk potentially with that too. So we, we decided to let that be, but certainly being able to go outside or be in the car with his folks and um, who, who now are vaccinated and wear a mask, that kind of stuff. So um, thinking like a scientist was used to help him to gradually face the fear. When we have less verbal kids, we, we create that same fear ladder and, you know, we may not be able to use words to convince them to do it, but if we can try to, you know, use a timer to have them stand by the front door, stand outside for 30 seconds, stand outside for a minute, then we give them lots of external rewards, access to their iPad or snack or other rewards for being able to do that. Um, the next way to lower anxiety to help them face their fear is exercise, right? Exercise has been shown to significantly reduce anxiety. So all my kids need to do some aerobic exercise, whether it's taking a vigorous walk, whether it's when it's raining out, they're on a stationary bike or a treadmill at home. It, it, it's medicine. It is their medicine. And it has better side effects than lots of medicines. Um, meditation is another one of those free, healthy ways to reduce anxiety. Um, I use this particular website with most of my kids called fragrantheart.com. It's a free website. You can download some little seven, eight minute meditation guides and they help somebody sort of focus in on the moment. See, distractions and focusing on the moment allow us to be without just ruminating endlessly about our anxiety. And a lot of my kids call them, oh, you're just distracting me. And I said, but that's really where life is led. Sitting around ruminating all day isn't the healthiest thing to do. Doing things can make us feel better. We, we, we were sort of, you know, um, maybe engineered as animals in some ways to do things. And um, for those who are less verbal, there's a, there's a tune called Weightless by Marconi Union. I'll type that into the chat box. Marconi Union. Uh, created the song called Union. Uh, it's called, called Weightless. And in a British study, just listening to this spa-like music, Weightless, reduced blood pressure and reduced anxiety. So a lot of my less verbal kids who don't necessarily want to follow the verbal meditation guides um, really enjoy just listening to spa-like music weightless being one of them. It's just really immediately affects them uh, and, and relaxes them. And all music can do that. I'm a musician and I'm going to play later today with folks. And it just is, it's, a, it's an incredibly necessary thing for me to do in between my clients. Um, and that brings me to special interests and hobbies. What's your meditation? You know, we often think of our kids, uh, Barry Prezant talks about the obsessive interests of kids on the spectrum are not things to get rid of. They, he calls them passions. They're passions. These passions serve a regulatory function. The thing you're interested in, you know, allows you to meditate on something so that you're not just spinningly spinning around ruminating about anxious stuff. I know many of you out there during the pandemic were baking and, and knitting and building things and woodworking and all these kinds of things, right? Um, those are good things to do. Put it on a schedule and have our kids do that to help regulate them. Medications uh, can be temporary. You can use anti-anxiety medicines, um, particularly the ones that are not addicting like SSRIs. The benzodiazepines are addicting. They work really well, but sort of too well. But the uh, SSRIs, Prozac, Zoloft, things like that are less addicting. Um, and uh, they can be temporary to help people face their fear. And once they realize things are okay, you can begin to taper off the medicine sometimes. So it doesn't have to be a lifelong decision. Um, let's talk a little bit about the restrictions that, of staying home that's been so difficult for some of our kiddos uh, and our adult clients. Let me give you an adult client. I had a 35-year-old guy 
group home ended during the pandemic, went home to his aging parents and was beating them up physically because he, they would not let him see his girlfriend. And uh, because he was, they were afraid that that way they would get COVID because he'd be kissing his girlfriend and, and spreading COVID. So he was enraged and he hit him. Uh, and so I was trying to help him. He is verbal. Uh, he has some intellectual challenges, but um, certainly verbal. And I was explaining the sort of heroic nature of staying away from his girlfriend so that he didn't get her sick, she didn't get him sick, and we don't get the parents sick. And of course, he's saying, well, I don't care about my parents. He said, but you do care about her, so you're being a hero to her too. So I'm sort of teaching him the, the ironic message, which is staying away from her is actually keeping her safe, right? We had to give, her all, give him alternatives. He could Zoom chat with her, which is not the same as kissing her for sure. And eventually we were able to give him a pretty good alternative, which is both of you get COVID tested and then quarantine for two weeks. And then you can get together and kiss each other. And, and that's what both sets of parents set up for them. Um, we also had to teach the, guard, the, the parents a little bit about sort of the grief process, which gave them a framework for being able to understand and tolerate better what they were seeing in their adult son, which is that when you don't get to do what you normally do, it's like grief. And you go through a process of denial because he was denying that there was COVID. COVID's not real. It's not there. It's not happening. And then eventually he agreed, okay, okay, it's there. And then he's angry about it and sad about it. And eventually it took his ability to fully accept COVID is there. It's real. And now that he's able to do something about it, we can help him. We, we were able to get him to agree to be tested and then quarantine for two weeks and her as well. And that's how they were able to get together. There were still times when logic failed with him and we just had to quickly get his favorite video game on TV show or just something to get his mind off of it. Okay. Um, structure, something that's missing sometimes when kids are at home doing remote learning. And so we need to create a visual schedule so they have some idea of what's expected during the day and what's expected should you know, be like normal life. You can't have a whole full day of school from home. It's just not feasible to sit on the computer all day. So a, a shortened amount of work, a little bit of social life scheduled in, uh, whether it's Zoom chats with your friends or getting outside together um, by a fire pit. We did a lot of that in our pandemic here in New Jersey. Um, and, um, and doing some kind of physical exercise and some kind of home routines. You know, we're making meals together, playing games together. That was all part of the schedule. Um, how do we get people to do work? I mean, I'm sorry that parents are put in this position to all of a sudden become special educators. And um, how do special educators get kids to do work? How do we do that? Well, first of all, we can use rewards. So we can say things like you have to do a certain amount of math on a timer, let's shrink it before you get to play with your iPad. So rewards are one way to do that. But another way is to make the work less scary to begin with. And so they're more willing to do it. So one way to do that is just reduce the time. People are much more willing to do, you know, one sentence than write five sentences or work for five minutes rather than 40 minutes. So if I was having trouble getting kids to sit at a Zoom class, I was instructing my parents to just tell them, just put on a timer. I just want you to be there for, you know, 10 minutes and then we can take a break. And what was rough about that as parents, as you know, is you kind of need to be nearby and it means you're not going to be able to do your regular work day the way you were. That's the reality, folks. I mean, there isn't any way around it. It, it has been a ridiculously difficult challenge. Now, sometimes parents who had the means were able to get a local older kid to come over and be sort of a zoom class sitter to help their young kid you know stay on on task for a little bit but what i'm saying is you've got to make the work look less intimidating so reducing the time re reducing uh, how scary the task looks how many problems you're going to do all gets them to just start and sometimes once they start then they'll stay it's just getting them started the other thing is make the activity more fun so the thing about school is the activities can be multi-sensory, a lot of hands-on projects in school. That's the best way to learn. There's some data that multi-sensory learning that, that involves smell uh, and involves uh, hearing and listening and physical movement. Kids tend to learn things better, right? You learn about history better when you 
dress up like the historical period and you act out things that happened and you know you'll learn better that way so how do we do that at home i mean you know cooking could become a great math lesson for fractions and adding and subtracting and multiplication and all of that kids who you know are trying to learn to read you know i have a good music uh, i have a good uh, uh, speech and language therapist who's created great programs where kids have like these treasure hunts throughout their house to find words and they have to sound them out and string them together to find a particular prize hidden in the house you know so the act of being able to find these words sound them out um, put them together allows you to you know get a prize um, older kids who just refuse to write papers you know all of a sudden are really into posting a youtube video and so if we have to write a script to do the youtube video it becomes very motivating it becomes a more fun thing to do model the work show them how to do it first don't let them make a mistake. If you if some kids make a mistake first, they're gone, they're out. And so you may have to show them how to do everything first. Along the same lines is the 80-20 rule. 80-20 rule means give them 80% that you know they are capable of doing before the 20% that's difficult. Because if you give them the 20% of work that's really hard first and they make a mistake with it, they get upset. And let me show you what that looks like. It's a video of a father trying to get his daughter to do a math worksheet on place value. So he says, here's what's in the tenths column, here's what's in the hundredths, and, and you tell me what's in the thousandth place. Well, so the first question he asked is one that she doesn't know the answer to. She gets frustrated, and no matter how hard he tries now, she's done. She's in the Incredible Hulk now. You're gonna hear her mother and her sister in the background saying something about a red house, but you can ignore that. But take a look at what happens and think about if your dad, how do you approach this work? And what do we teach her instead of tantruming? Okay. Come here, Rachel. Come on. Where's your bigger Rachel? What do you need? Stop scribbling all over your paper. Like I need to go to Red House. Okay, now, there's the desk. Where's Lyra? Okay, where's the thousands? Lyra? Lyra? Hundreds. Where's the thousands? Okay. Here, here. Look, I'm helping you. Up to Red House. Look. Okay. What's this? I don't know. I've written it, so now you do know. Tell me. <laughs> this is the chart. I don't know how to play this one. Here you go. What place is this? Here's the decimal. What do you call this? What's it say? What's the answer for? All you have to do is read it from the chart. So maybe that looks like your house. It certainly looked like my house sometimes when my kids were young. Um, my daughter hated math. But here's what happened. Dad didn't show her how to do everything ahead of time, right? Um, he asked, what's in the thousands place? That's the hardest one. So now she's melting down, right? Um, maybe it would have been better to show her everything. Here's what's in the tens. Here's what's in the hundreds. What, here's what's in the thousands. Which one do you want to do? Oh, the number five? That, you mean the hundreds? The number five? Oh, what's the answer? Five. You got it right. Great job. Build that confidence to get her feeling good about the work, right? Um, what are we going to do with her now that she's freaking out like this? Guys, uh, put it in your chat box. What, what are we doing with her now? She's freaking out. And so what do we do? Anybody? Want to type it in? And let me say this to you. We, we worry, oh, is she avoiding the work? Well, yeah, distract is right. Jenna Sir says distract, and I totally agree with you. Um, comfort and distract, right? I don't think she's trying to avoid the work. She didn't run away. She's just sitting there frustrated. So I'm okay to go distract her with what? A novel item, uh, a special interest. We go look at her Disney books together for a little bit till she calms down. Uh, sensory activity we take a walk we listen to music and then do i go right back and do that work guys type it in what do you think should i go back and, and give her the place value worksheet now that i got her calm go ahead put it in your chat what do you think anybody 
Well, I'll tell you what I think, unless I see a typing coming in. Maybe not, model it, redirect to work she has success with. Laura says, yeah, exactly. Go back and do the 80-20 rule. If I go back and show her the same um, work that got her upset to begin with, that piece of paper is now an anxiety trigger. It's a, it's a trigger for trauma, right? So I don't even show it to her. We go back, what's two plus two? What's four plus four? What's five? Wow, you're doing great. And then on a separate blank piece of paper, I take out a decimal point. And I say tens, hundreds, thousands. Which one do you want to do? Hundreds. What do you mean the number five? What's the answer to that one? Five. You got it right. Hey, you know what you just did? That's place value. We back into it because I don't want to get her all anxious again. What she really needs to is to teach, to learn this skill. I call it the skill trying when it's hard. Trying when it's hard, it means um, doing something that Carol Dweck would call the growth mindset. It means trying it and asking for help if you need it. The biggest obstacle for kids with special needs is when they, when they can't do it, they think they're stupid. And so they don't want to try anymore. They want to quit. And they don't want to ask for your help because they feel stupid that they have to ask for help. And we have to teach them Carol Dweck's concept that when you don't know how to do the work, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you're learning, right? You're not supposed to know how to do it. Place value, sweetie, when I was your age, it took me three months to learn this. So this is not about not being smart. It takes time to learn it. And the only way you learn is by trying it. And you have to ask for help. I mean, how else do you learn? So let's look at Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck is a psychologist who back in 1988 was doing this research with kids and showed that kids' theories of intelligence, whether they had a growth mindset about their intelligence or a fixed mindset, determined how motivated they were to work. Um, people with a fixed mindset thought that they were just born with a brain that doesn't really change. You're just, some people are born bright, some people not as bright. And so people like who think that way they don't want to do difficult work that will expose them as uh, incompetent. And so they just pick things they already know how to do. They don't want to make a mistake in front of others because they'll just quit because they figure this is too upsetting. I'm no good. I'm stupid. They don't want help because they feel especially special ed help means I'm incompetent. And of course, they have lower learning outcomes because they're not trying the hard things. They're quitting and they're not getting help. But if you teach people to have a growth mindset, which means your brain changes by trying things it doesn't know how to do. And, and that means you're going to make mistakes, but mistakes are actually quite helpful because they help you focus on the thing that you got to work on. And, and how do you work on that? Well, you seek help. Like you ask, how do I do this? And by effort and asking for help, you get better. And she has shown this in education, in business, in music, in athletics, People who have a growth mindset have better outcomes. And so what we're teaching kids is this very important skill. You're not supposed to know how to do it. I don't care if you get it right or not. I want, are you, are you willing to try it, especially stuff you don't know? Ask to watch. Show me how to do it. Ask for help, right? Uh, if you're frustrated, take a break. And then let's come back. We'll try it again with a fresh head negotiate is okay. If you're a verbal kid, we can negotiate, you know, mom, I'll do this part, but can you help me with this part? If I write this sentence, will you write the other part? So I reward kids for growth, for trying when it's hard. I do not reward them for getting their work right or wrong. When they're frustrated kids, I reward them for effort, not outcome. And effort means that they try it or they ask for help. They stay at the table and ask somebody to teach it to them. So it doesn't mean you do it by yourself. It doesn't mean you do it right. It simply means you're kind of trying. That's what you get rewarded for, okay? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to let you go on YouTube if you'd like to see a set of YouTube video modeling lessons. One of them is uh, on this skill that we just called, that we just talked about, trying when it's hard. So if you go to YouTube, you type in my name, Jed Baker, no more meltdowns, you'll get a, you know, six or seven of these um, video modeling lessons that you can use for free with your, with your kids and staff and such. But I think it's easier for you to watch that on your own and, and for me to get through some material so I could take your questions. Um, if you are transitioning back to school, one of my colleagues, James Ball, wrote a nice little workbook. Um, I think it's available as a PDF. 
but it's just a way to transition kids back to the regular school environment if they've been in remote learning. And he has, you know, parents imitate the school schedule. He has them practice wearing masks. So they're ready for that when they're in school. Um, this is a nice little link from CincinnatiChildrens.org on sort of why we wear a mask and how to do it and how to pick a mask that, you know, doesn't give kids sensory issues. Like I actually can't tolerate the KN95 masks because they pull my ears. But I found that if I, if I got those masks and I used a paper clip with a rubber band, I could tie it, I, I could just tie it around my head and not use um, the actual mask uh, uh, straps around my ears. Um, yep, Tara just uh, talked about where we might be able to get this. Video sessions with teachers uh, or a safety person at school would be helpful. So before a kid goes back to school, who's my person that I go to if ever I have a problem? So that they know that there's always somebody in their corner there, right? And when you get back to school, maybe we, we do the most fun stuff first so that we don't make that kid hate going back to school. Like we, we consider as a teacher making it the most less demanding stuff initially so they enjoy being back. Let's talk about another trigger, okay? Nope, you cannot have a piece of cake now, but if you're calm, mommy has some beautiful consolation prizes behind curtain number two. Uh, this is about teaching, this is from my No More Meltdown book. This is about teaching kids that all is not lost if you don't get what you want. There's always something to live for. It's about teaching kids how to wait. How do we teach that? Well, I remember having this kid grabbing at these cookies in a classroom because they were gonna have a Valentine's Day party. And he did not await. He's a less verbal kid. He's just grabbing the cookies. The teacher's like, no, nah, the party's not for 40 minutes. You can't touch them. And how do I teach the kid how to wait? Well, I mean, he was melting down because he couldn't have those cookies. But I took him to my support room where I could teach him how to wait. I have cookies too. And I, and I used a visual timer. So if you go to uh, um, on your you know iPhones or your droids, there's a bunch of uh, apps called Time Timer. And these are visual timers for kids who may not otherwise tell time. It may show a shape that's shrinking or an hourglass. So, so kids can actually see the progress of time uh, passing, which makes it easier to wait. So I say to him, well, you want a cookie? Cookie, wait. I make him wait about 10 seconds and he sees a shape shrinking. Beep. Now you can have the cookie. Hey, do you want two cookies? Cookies. And now I make him wait a whole minute. And he, but he sees the shape shrinking and he knows from last time what happens that when the shape disappears, he can have the cookie. Then I make him wait two minutes and have a bigger or three minutes and have a bigger shape that's shrinking, but he knows it's getting there, it's getting there. And so through this process, he's learning that weight doesn't mean no, he can't ever have something. It means there's a timer, timer's up, he'll, he'll get what he wants. And that became you know something that was portable. He used to push kids off the laptop, but now we had a timer and he knew to wait until the timer went off. Um, visual schedules for kids' favorite activities, like when they wanna play video games 24 seven, it's another form of a timer, you know? It's easier to get off of uh, a video game if you know when you can go back. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of complications with that. Like, you know, when you're playing Fortnite or something, or, um, you know, sometimes the games are not perfectly timed. So we would just have rules with kids. Like you can't start a new game after a certain amount of time. Um, and, but don't worry, because if you stop and you still had like 10 minutes left, we'll add that to the next time uh, on your schedule that you're allowed to play. So we have to make some deals with kids, but we're not in there to stamp out their interest. We're there to just sort of put it on a schedule. Uh, perseverative routines. What do I mean by that? I mean, there's some kids who do things in a repetitive way that bother other people. Like I had a toilet flusher and a light switcher who in a classroom kept, you know, bothering people by turning the lights on and off. And so we would videotape it, put it on an iPad. And so anytime he wanted to see the lights go out, he could just do it virtually. And that allowed him to have his routine without it imposing on others. And that's kind of a, a rule, you know, like you get to do what you want, but you can't hurt others, right? Um, accepting no is more difficult than waiting. Accepting no is like, you have to teach kids if you don't get one thing, but you're chill, there are other things. And so that's what I'm teaching kids in this video who were 14 to 21. 
and they've been kicked out of a lot of high schools because of their aggressive behavior hitting staff. And they end up at this GED program, part of Rutgers University Developmental Disability Program, where I'm teaching these guys about waiting or accepting no, and they might get something else they want. So you'll see me explain, model, and role play this to them. Guys, you know what all these people have in common? What are, what are some of their talents? Anybody? What are, what are they have Asperger's. What does that mean? What are some of the Advanced strengths species. of people? That's exactly what I think, right? Say it again. Advanced species. AS stands for advanced species, okay? A lot of people with Asperger's syndrome are brilliant, talented people, right? Oh, I have kids with Asperger's, students with Asperger's, who, you know, all of them experience stress on a daily basis um, in terms of handling the academic and social demands. Some people handle that by withdrawing and becoming depressed, and they don't really bother anybody else, but they're having their own internal struggle. Others handle it by externalizing and acting out and becoming sometimes verbally or sometimes physically aggressive. I'm going to get ready to interrupt you, to stop you right in the middle. You going to deal with it? Yes. Give me a high five. Oh. I, I'm so pleased that you did that. Can, I, can you put it down? Because watch what I'll do. Watch what I'll do. Go ahead now. He, did he stop in the middle? Mm -hmm. Great job. Give me a high job. five. Great job. A lot of social skills just come naturally. You sort of know what to do because you're, you're reading other people's minds, you know, not like a psychic, but just getting an idea of, you know, uh, if, I, if I can accept no for an answer, you know, the person will be cool with me and then I may get what I want. That just comes naturally, you're reading that perspective. That's not coming naturally for these guys. All right, check this out. Wait a second. I want, I want to teach you something first. Hold on, Stefan. Sometimes... When you ask for something like pretzels, people might name. say no. Look at number 56. Right? Sometimes people say no when you ask okay, for something. Okay, used to it. Well, if you do get used to it, if you're cool about it, if you don't get mad, others will be pleased with you, and they might give you what you want later. <coughs> or if they can't give you that, they might give you something else you want. Right? You can make explicit what's not coming naturally. That's the purpose of these skill lessons. Pam, can I have some of that uh, chocolate? I'm sorry, Jed. That belongs to somebody else. You fascist! You're a fascist! I hate you! I can't stand you! But what you saw was just skill acquisition, just the knowledge of skills. And so what we did today won't go very far unless we also make efforts to generalize those skills, meaning to um, remind them of this issue seconds before they might need it. Did I accept no about the chocolate? Did I accept that? Mm -mm. She was not pleased? She wasn't pleased. That's right. David, how was she feeling when I yelled? I Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Did it make her want to give me the pretzels? No. No. We're always keeping them on, sort of aware of the light at the end of the tunnel. And so we don't always have to create the artificial rewards for that. They already exist. For the most part, all of us have something invested in maintaining control. There's always something good that happens if we maintain that self-control. Oh, you want to see that? Yeah. Um, no, not right now. Oh, give me a high five. No. <laughs> you did it. Okay. So we explain, we model, we role play, uh, and it doesn't generalize, right? Just, cause, just because I taught them a skill like this doesn't mean the next day when they go to the snack machine and the snack takes their money and doesn't give them the snack that they realize, oh, this is like accepting no. Uh, let me problem solve. They don't do that. They break the machine unless every morning we prime their Dr. Banner forebrain that um, they might not get something they want, but all won't be lost. Uh, like if you don't get um, your snack out of the snack machine, look, I have backup snacks here in the closet. You know, if it's raining out, I have your favorite uh, photography and musical equipment to use. So we don't have if we can't go outside and play today. Um, I also set up a disappointment poster with these guys, which we did up in that uh, particular program where anything time they didn't get what they wanted, if they were able to stay relatively calm and not be verbally or physically aggressive, um, they got a point on the disappointment poster. And as a group, when we got to 20 points, we would go to the school store and they could purchase something. So it meant if I don't get this, I still could earn points for that. Okay. So that's a very concrete way to always help people keep an eye that there's something else to live for. Um, but again, you've got to prime the Dr. Banner forebrain ahead of time. You can't expect them to remember that lesson from a day ago. You've got to remind them 
prep them that they might not get something they want if we go to the store and they're out of this thing. But if you don't freak, there's something else that's good that's coming your way. We can try to keep them aware of it. And for less verbal kids, we do it through their visual schedule. So if it's raining out, we sort of cross out the outdoor recess and we put in its place their favorite indoor game as a way to say, well, we, if we don't get this today, there's this in its place. There's something else to live for. Uh, threats to self-esteem. Let's start with handling mistakes. Carol Dweck said, if you're going to grow, you've got to do things you don't know, and you're going to make mistakes. Mistakes help us to learn. Let me prove it to you. We're all going to say the word silk together. S-I-L-K. How many people? We've got 34 people who are all going to say silk out loud with me on, in, in, on the count of three, right? S-I-L-K. We'll say it together. Are you guys ready? Put it in your chat. Let me know you're alive. Say yes if you're ready. So, so I know you're still there. Okay, good. At least Kendra's there. Ready? Here we go. Silk, 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 silk. What do cows drink? Put it in your chat. What do cows drink? Type it up. Right, but milk is not the right answer. Cows give milk. They don't drink milk. They drink water. So I tricked you. And Brenda's laughing about it, but I tricked you in order to show you that mistakes help you to learn. Like now you know that trick. If I say it again, hey, uh, let's say silk three times fast together. You ready, guys? Here we go. Silk, silk, silk. What do cows drink? Type it in your chat room. Oh, now a lot of people are saying water. How did you know? Because you learned it. That's how you learn. That's how learning happens. Go make some mistakes. So you tell your perfectionist kid or client, every time you make a mistake with your work, that suggests to me you are trying to learn something new. So if you make a mistake, you get help and you learn from it, I'm going to give you three points on your behavior chart. If instead you got the work right the first time, that's worth less. That's only worth two points. And so I don't do this for everybody, but I do this for my perfectionistic kids where I reward them for handling the mistake and learning rather than getting it right the first time. Same thing with losing a game. If you lose a game and you don't get mad, well, then people will want to play with you. You win the invisible game of friendship, but you also get three points on your behavior chart. But if on the other hand, if you win the game, well, that's easy to handle. You only get two points for that. So we're giving out points for handling imperfection, right? Teasing is another big issue. We've got to teach people how to handle teasing. Like it's not really about you. The person who's doing the teasing has the problem. You know, check it out first. Did you mean that? Because sometimes kids just want to play and they're not really meaning it. Um, so check it out first. Uh, if you don't like what they said, hey, could you stop? calmly because if you say shut up you know then they then they know they can get you a mad so part of the game is acting like it doesn't get to you so can you stop ignore it walk away if it continues you report it reporting is not the same as tattling tattling is tell is telling on somebody or reporting something that is non-dangerous or harmful if someone's breaking a rule in school by chewing gum and you report it and you want them expelled for that that's being the rule police or being a tattletale it's not dangerous, but if somebody is calling you names or threatening to hurt you and you report it, actually that's being brave, right? You're helping other people because that person is probably teasing other people too. So we teach them how to handle teasing, but more importantly, we need to protect them from teasing. So a lot of our peer buddy programs, like you'll see in this video um, that we did many years ago in Melbourne Middle School is, is there to protect kids as well as teach them some important social skills. Take a look. Last night, we met some young people who have a form of autism called Asperger's syndrome, gentle, vulnerable children who had become the targets of constant taunts from classroom bullies because they are different. Tonight, ABC's John Donvan looks at how one school has found a creative way to help protect these children and teach everyone something in the process. Middle school, where the worst thing when you're one of the different kids, as Noah Orent is, the worst thing is the other kids. In my old school, I never had many friends. I was just merely called Game Boy Freak or stuff. Game Boy Freak? Yeah. yeah. That was before. This is now. 
On a scale from one to ten, how happy would you be here? Let's do our conversation game. Here's what we're going to do, guys. This year, Noah attends Milburn, New Jersey Middle School, where psychologist Jed Baker is proving that the best protection for kids like Noah, who was bullied for years for his disability, Asperger's syndrome, a form of high-functioning autism, the best protection is the other kids. What's your favorite game to play? Can't tell. Can't, can't tell? It's a secret. It's a, it's a secret. I'm just kidding. I think it's cool like that even though they're not like me, I can still be, have things in common with them. <laughs> Baker has recruited Becca and other kids as essentially his assistants in teaching Noah and Eli social skills that Asperger's make so challenging for them, like simple conversation. It's benefiting all students to really respond to the needs to teach kids in social emotional skills. The thing is, they're getting it. So it's easier here. Yeah, Why? now I have like a big crew. You have a huge crew now? Yeah. A lot of friends. Good, good. In fact, kids strive to get into the program here at Milburn. More than 90% of the eighth grade class is signed up, and bullying of kids with Asperger's, it's non existent here. Working with what were once called the uncool kids yeah. has become a cool thing to do. Yeah, I think it's part of the identity and value of a lot of the peers in that environment to be sort of a good person. Uh, to Imagine be, that. Yeah. You want to find out what game she likes? What game she likes? I like some kids, especially needs a lot of people just ignore them. It makes me feel really good that I made some like somebody else like smile or just make their day. It's like I'm in heaven here. Really? But back there, it's like oh. <laughs> so this is heaven. Yes. What Noah and other kids like him are learning here, they're going to need it because in the world outside, Aspergers will always make them different, and most people don't get the lessons they teach so well here at Milburn Middle School. John Donvan, ABC News, Milburn, New Jersey. Well, I put this up here to show you how to sort of protect kids from being teased, but it's also a key component of social skill training, as we'll talk about next week, uh, that we involve peers sometimes, that it's not just a, a one-way street to get our kids to join in, but get others to reach out. So next week, I'll show you more about these peer buddy programs and how to set them up for kids with less language as well. Um, let us talk about um, a couple of other things before we take some questions. Unmet needs for attention. So some kids who want your attention all the time uh, and at the wrong time because you're on the phone, you know, you can put a schedule together so they know when they can have your undivided attention. Um, you can use a red card and a green card, red light, green light, to let them know when you're available versus not available if being on the phone is not clear to them, right? Um, there are kids who get attention I mentioned in provocative ways, the kids who learned how to curse or say something that got others to giggle and forever they do it now and, it, and they do it in the wrong place. Um, they have a, a lack of a skill that I call being sensitive to the listener's interest. So they do the same joke to everybody and you know, with their kid, their friend, maybe it's oh, it was okay to curse, but not with their teacher, not with their grandma, right? So we need to sort of show them the right place for different things. Some of those kids do well in theater because if you give them a place to be the center of attention, they it satisfies that need a little bit. Um, but I, I find myself often having to teach um, what they can say and where. So I use a, a cue card that often looks something like this, like in public spaces, you go to a store, you're outside, there's other people you don't know. These are things you can talk about, but in pri only in private can you talk about these topics. So I write down what we call sensitive topics, sex, violence, race, religion, politics, insults, and curses. These are some categories of things that some kids some, uh, and, and our clients sometimes talk about that really you know, trigger other people. I mean, this year, politics was a big one. I, I had a, a young adult group uh, and within the group, there were people who uh, just ragefully hated Trump. And then there were people who were Trump supporters. And, and if they brought up politics, it was an explosion. And so they, we had to look around the room, see who's here, and then you know what you can say and what you can't say, right? Um, religion can be that way too, you know, uh, can be a, a sort of a hot uh, button for some people. Um, and certainly race, you know, what race are you? I had kids going up to people, what religion are you? What race are you? And, and that the people don't know how they're, they're, they're going to use that information. Um, 
a kid walking around high school saying, are you a virgin? How about you, virgin? Right? Sex makes people uncomfortable. Violence. Um, you know, I've got a bomb. Kid thought it was hilarious to go to the airport with his family on vacation and say, and the TSA, you know, uh, was checking him through. I, I got a bomb, you know, well, guess what? I mean, joke or not, eh, there's not going to fly at the airport. So, you know, this was a kid we had to teach him. He could do it in private, whisper it to his therapist, to his family, but in public, it was more past, future, present, and common interest. Those are categories of good ways to start conversations. Past, how was your week? Future, what are you going to do after school? What are you going to do later? Present, hey, what are you guys playing? What are you guys reading? What are you guys talking about? And maybe the best way to start a conversation is with information I already know about you. Oh, oh, I remember you said you got a dog. How's your dog doing? Or, you know, or did you play uh, soccer the other day? You said you were going to play a soccer game. So it's asking about things you know about the other person. So we teach the skill, but that doesn't get them to necessarily do it. Sometimes, you know, um, you have to teach the peers. Well, sometimes we use a response cost system, which says basically, you know, if you say anything on the left side, that's fine, you'll get rewarded. But if you say anything on the right side in public, you'll get a warning. We, like that kid who used to go around saying, are you a virgin in high school? He used to get a snack at the end of the day. And then he would watch The Simpsons when he went home at night. And so if he said anything inappropriate, he'd get up to two warnings. And then the third time he said something inappropriate, he would lose his snack at the end of the day. And if he said it again, he'd lose the first 10 minutes of watching The Simpsons and so on. So this is a lost system and it's not something you do with the Incredible Hulk. It's only something to entertain with someone who's dysregulated with positive emotions, not somebody dysregulated with negative emotions. And finally, that alone won't work. You got to teach the kids, the other, the other peers to turn away when he says inappropriate things and not laugh. And for them to remind him, hey, if you ask me about my week, I'm happy to talk to you. But if you, if you start talking about sex, I'm out, I'm out. And so that helped him more than anything because he learned what worked and what didn't with peers. Uh, the last couple of things is sensory issues, right? We could do weeks and weeks on sensory issues. But what I want to talk to you about here is whatever we determine is a useful sensory environment for the kid to reduce noise, to have a safe space when you go out to public places if it gets too noisy, or if it's a kid with ADHD and they get bored and they need to fidget with something or they need to take sensory breaks, whatever it is, we wanna teach that, the, that we want the child to become a self-advocate for that, to explain to people what they need, right? So rather than, uh, you know, just running out of the room because they're bored to tell the teacher, you know, I, I have ADHD and I need some sensory breaks and to sort of advocate for him or herself or, or the noise in the hallway is too great. So can I leave early from the classroom before the classes switch? Um, so we want that youngster to be able to advocate if they're less verbal, maybe they have it on a card that we've written and they hand it to a substitute teacher, it follows them along so everybody knows what their sensory modifications are. And the other rule around sensory issues is you can have the environment that works for you, but you can't impose it on others. So for example, lots of kids I have riding in cars, blasting music, and they've had to learn how to use headphones so it doesn't create fights with their siblings. Um, one other thing about sensory issues, sometimes we see a lot of self-stim behavior, rocking and hand flapping. And that's not necessarily something to get rid of. Those are often self-regulatory skills. But if you see a lot of it, you have to ask, why are they needing to self-regulate more now? And it's often because they're either bored or they're anxious and frustrated because they don't understand what you're saying to them. They don't understand your instructions. So often when you see a lot of self-stimulatory behavior, it's a signal for us to try to instruct and engage the individual in a different way. How do I bring my language down so that they're understanding what I'm saying? Or how do I make them less bored so they don't have to be doing some self-stimulatory kind of thing? If I don't take it away, we'll have scheduled time to self-stim, but um, right now maybe I'm using too much language for a kid who doesn't have that receptive language and we need to do something more hands-on like touch your nose, touch your head, touch your shoulder. And all of a sudden that kid's more engaged with me and less in their self-stim world. Uh, let's see. The last thing I want to talk to you about before we now take questions is unexpected triggers. How do we get that kid ready for all the things that will set them off that we didn't prepare for that weren't in our seven categories of triggers? Well, what we do is we create a 
distraction or relaxation folder where we put both pictures and words of the things that are calming to them and the picture or the name of the person that they go to to help them when they're upset. And so for a less verbal kid, it could really be a picture schedule of here you are upset, here, here's you playing Legos since that calms you down, and here, here you are seeing Miss Johnson who helps you when you're upset. And so that little picture schedule is something we'd go over in the morning with them. And then later on the day, if they're upset, we take out the picture schedule and we try to prompt them through it so they can self-regulate on their own. Wait, here you are upset now. What do we do? And we point and okay, go play with Legos. And the kid begins to relax. Go see Miss Johnson. Maybe Miss Johnson gives him a hug or tries to figure out what he needs, that kind of thing. But if it's a verbal kid, a highly verbal kid, we're going to add some important self-talk. And so when we have that relaxation folder with pictures and words of calming, we also remind them of this. All problems can be solved or at least greatly improved if you could do two things. If you could wait and talk to the right person. I live by this. All my clients work on this. Uh, my adult clients, my kid clients, and all problems can be solved. You can wait and talk to the right person, you know? And so this is a exercise in patience, but it's also comes back to the word of the day, hope. If I have hope that there's someone out there who can help me, then I am more willing to wait. And then it's easier for me to control myself, right? The pandemic worked that way. When I had hope that vaccines were coming, it was a lot easier for me to follow the guidelines and wait. I heard a lot of people saying, I, I'm not doing this forever. Forget about it. I'm not doing it. And I was willing to wait because I became, I had the hope that the mRNA vaccines were coming out and we're going we're gonna to do the right thing, which they have. Um, so uh, trusting human beings, if I trust people out there, that equals hope. And if I have hope, that equals greater self-control. Trust equals hope equal self-control. Okay? That's something that I want to put in everybody's Dr. Banner forebrain before they get hijacked. Whatever happens today, kiddo, stuff will go down. There'll be problems. But I promise you, if you find me or if you find Miss Johnson in room 33, we may not be there when it happens. If you can wait for us, we will make it better. I promise we'll make it better. And that kind of trust and hope is what allows people to control themselves. All right, in closing, we started with how do we manage our own feelings? Can we tolerate our own incredible Hulk when we get triggered, when we're threatened by our kids and our clients? Tolerate it long enough not to make it worse and escalate, but to say, okay, how do I make this better tomorrow? How do I think about, how do I use my Dr. Banner forebrain to sort of think about why this is happening, modify the trigger, teach them a better way to deal with it, right? And do you like what you're doing? Parents, professionals out there, the key to life satisfaction is not making money and it's not drugs and it's not great food and it's not these hedonistic pleasures. Those are nice things, but they, they last not very long. Hedonistic pleasure is temporary. What seems to be related to life satisfaction is knowing that you were needed, knowing that you're valued, and that's what you guys do. You're, you're valued as a professional, as a parent, in helping to launch your kids so give yourselves a pat on the back and a round of applause for what you do. Keep doing that. Um, let's take your questions. Uh, these are just some of my books that are out there and resources. I'm happy to talk about them all. They're all on Amazon, but um, tell me what your questions are. Let's see if I see any in the chat. Uh, okay. While you're typing in some questions or um, I don't know if you're allowed to unmute yourselves and I can hear you. That's another way. But the No More Meltdown book on the top is about, what I don't know, 12 bucks on Amazon. That's the book about prevention plans, much of what I talked about today. The books on the bottom there are social skill training books, both manuals as well as picture books. Uh, the music CD, you can go to socialmusic.com and you'll see music and lyrics that go along with some of my young kid uh, social skill lessons that are in the picture book. So that's what the Be A Friend music CD is. I also talked today about this Overcoming Anxiety book. That's another $11, $12 on Amazon with a sort of quick uh, 
you know, case examples of how we approach different anxiety disorders with kids, both with language and, and some then with much less language functioning. And then there's No More of Victims, which is a book on cyber safety, how we try to help kids be safe in the cyber world and School Shadow Guidelines, a book for paraprofessionals working as uh, uh, aides and paras in school. So um, that's what's out there. Uh, any questions, guys? So Jed, I can, um, I can allow participants to talk. Um, so they can wave their, there's a wave or something, right? Yeah. Or you could just allow them to talk. And then, I'll just go through and allow everybody to talk. Um, yeah, so if someone has a question, we've got a, a couple minutes before I do my meditation today. <laughs> I am. I am in between my clients and my webinars. I'm going to play some jazz music with a, a group of folks. Is that your favorite to, is jazz? Well, I'm, you know, I've been playing a little, I'm starting to join a little sort of funk Motown band too. So, but it's some of the same guys. So. Interesting. Yeah, it's been easier to do that outside than to, to do other things during the pandemic. Um, so everybody has every problem solved. Ah, okay, meltdowns with power or internet outage uh, has morphed to fear of storms. Winter. Yeah, I have, a, I have a girl like that. Um, she's, she's now 25, 26 years old. And... Um, you know, so I don't know if CD, if you're talking about a, a verbal or less verbal individual, the, the young lady I had had some intellectual challenges, but was verbal. And I was able to sort of do the think like a scientist kind of stuff. Are you overestimating how bad it will be? Uh, are you overestimating the probability of the power going out, number one? And are, are you overestimating uh, how bad it would be if that happened? And um, so CD, you could maybe type in and tell me if your kid is verbal or not, well, who you're talking about, but the, the, the young lady who was verbal, she could understand that once they had a, we had Sandy, the storm here that just knocked out everything for nine days that traumatized her. But since then they've cut down a lot of branches and we really haven't had as many power outages. So she understands she's overestimating the probability of a power going out when there's a storm. And then how severe is it? Well, since then they got a generator. Um, or they uh, found some other means to be prepared for an outage. And all of that was also quite helpful to her in sort of mitigating how bad it would be, the severity. So I don't know if CD, if that would be helpful to you, if you're able to say that or show a visual schedule of that. Um, it's going to be much more difficult if it's of a less verbal. Oh yeah, verbal but limited IQ. Uh, outages are fairly frequent. You know, look, uh, you're contemplating a generator, but um, yeah, the, the internet is dependent, I guess, on your area too. I mean, are the cell, the cell phone towers down as well? You know, I mean, basically what you're just trying to do is whatever fixes you have, you're, you're going to just try to make sure that uh, he or she knows about that ahead of time. Um, so if you're talking to your kid, mute yourself. You, there's a mute button on the, in your thing in the lower left. Um, okay. Uh, Sue asks, what is the best way to deal with unrealistic ideas? My daughter want, uh, wants to move away because she doesn't realize how much support she really needs. Um, so why does she want to move away though? You mean like, I'm not sure, Sue, uh, to answer that question what she wants to move away because she's mad at you at the moment because you didn't give her something or she wants to move away because she wants to live independently, but you don't think she's ready for it. Um, what, what are we maybe talking about Sue? Because, you know, I mean, it might be possible to, you know, move to a, a more independent living situation. There's a sort of whole continuum of supports uh, potentially out there. Oh, she wants to move to Florida. Yeah. Um, me too. Right? I did. I don't want any more. I don't want to move there anymore, by the way, <laughs> um, after the pandemic. But it's nice to be in warmer weather, that's for sure. 
Um, and, um, you know, what can I tell you? Uh, it, it, you, you could, how do we teach people to get a, a better way to get what they want? So why Florida? Is it the warmer climate thing? Is it some other fantasy she has? Um, has she been to Florida on vacation? So she thinks living there would be like the vacation. Um, so, you know, there might be a way to sort of show her the reality of it, of a, like a group home in Florida that might not be less appealing. Like that's the reality of it. So she might have to actually sort of physically see the reality of it, but there might be something else that she's looking for. And maybe there's something right in Connecticut where she can have access to peers and a more independent living or so. So Sue, without knowing the specifics, but the way I would be thinking about it is like, what is it that she sees and wants in Florida? And is there a more realistic way to give her some of that so that there's some kind of a, a sense of compromise, a sense of meeting her needs without putting her at risk of being in danger? Judy asked, do you have suggestions on stopping destruction of belongings when he has a meltdown? He's mostly nonverbal. So Judy, um, I don't have any specific instructions for stopping any particular behavior. What I have is a strategy, Judy, for you to determine what was the trigger for him destroying his belongings um, and then creating the prevention plans to prepare for those triggers. So the work to do from my point of view, Judy, is to figure out whenever he destroys his belongings, what was the triggering situation and then you go back and look at the, be, the prevention plans that we were talking about today and see, could I use those to make it less likely for him to get that frustrated that he destroys uh, his belongings? Um, but I would be inclined you know, to, uh, for him to understand if he destroys something, it's like it doesn't reappear the next day necessarily. Um, Judy talks that your grandson lost his mom and he's grieving. So, so what we're saying is he is uh, chronically upset. Um, but I would say, Judy, that even though there's a grief, and by the way, uh, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. That is why my lost his mom. So this is your, I'm a little confused. This is your daughter. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Judy, I'm so sorry. Um, so so th this, is, this is so hard on everybody. Um, but my experience when kids are grieving and there's loss is there's still sometimes an immediate trigger. So there's a higher level of upset all, all the time. But on top of that, it's still when like they couldn't use their video game or something didn't work that they, there still might be an immediate trigger. So so we can't fix the loss of his mom. That is not a fixable thing, but we can fix and maybe modify the more immediate triggers. And by the way, although we can't fix the loss of his mom, we can look at all the things that this young boy did with his mom that were self-regulating and comforting and see if we can replace that. There's a beautiful story we used to tell to kids in our first job was in the inner city with they were pretty verbal kids, um, but often they had lost their parents to uh, drugs uh, or incarceration. And um, it was just a story about a, a little um, porcupine who had lost his mom and he would go to, uh, he, he was, um, you see these tiger cubs drinking milk from the mom and he would go to the tiger cub, the tiger to get milk. And, and yet he was afraid that the tiger would eat him. So he would stick out his porcupine needles and, and the tiger had to say, look, I'm happy to give you milk, but if you stick your needles out because you're afraid I'm gonna eat you, then you know I, I can't give you the milk. Um, and they sort of made this deal that if the porcupine could lay his needles down, he could drink from the tiger's milk anytime he wanted to. Well, the point of this metaphorical story is you can't uh, ever replace his mom entirely, but there are maybe um, people in his life and certain activities that we could schedule again that will bring him into some self-regulated place uh, and lower his um, uh, the, the, the anger that certainly has got to be very raw soon after this loss. Um, but, and we can also maybe 
again, mitigate or lessen the immediate triggers, right? Developing those prevention plans for accepting no or having to wait for things, uh, developing those prevention plans for when you're frustrated with an activity, learning to ask for help or ask for a break, hand a break card, using timers to help him wait for things, right? And so maybe what he also lost was a mom who knew all, all, all those things too, who, were doing, who was doing some of those things with him. And so it, it may take some people to relearn sort of how he works too. Um, you're very welcome, Judy. Uh, I, I wish you the best. And I, I hope there's some people who, who can help you uh, locally, wherever you are, and, and think about sort of brainstorming some of that. Um, let's see. Laura looks like she was about to ask something. Who's? But I didn't get the rest of the message. Yep, there's one. It starts kind of up above. Oh. Uh, it popped in in between two adults. Oh, I think working with adults with IDD and mental illness whose parents are no longer able to manage care for them due to aging or death. This is great information for those clients who experienced that loss. Thank you. Oh, um, this is a comment. Yeah, I don't know if she was going to ask another question, but I do see the who's and. Yeah, well, no, I think she meant. Uh... Yeah, comment. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, right. There is a continuum of care. Um, and, you know, there are lots of different situations that uh, adults with IDD and mental illness uh, can access. So I, I have. Um, folks who live in their own apartment where there's someone downstairs who supervises. Then I have people who live in a group home um, with someone who's 24 hour living in the same space with them. They need that level of care. Um, let's see, Jenna says, I, I got to get going, but thank you for the course. Okay, well, I got to get going too, Jenna. <laughs> so I wish you well, I wish everybody well. Uh, I, I would take one more question and then, I, and then I think I do have to run after that. And hopefully we'll see some of you guys next week um, for the social skills training uh, piece, some of which I spoke about today, but I'll speak in more detail about skills training next week. Any final last minute questions? All righty then. Um, so shall we adjourn for today then? I think so. Um, just before we do go, um, for Judy, um, if you want to reach out to us here at the office, Judy, we do have some resources. We have some books and things um, that kind of help with grieving for children and individuals in the spectrum, if that's something that you're interested in. And maybe they can access, if they don't have it already, uh, any in-home um, behavior care who can sort of help figure out how to how to put back in place at least yeah. some of the activities that we're missing. Again, you can't replace a parent, but my experience has been sometimes um, by replacing the activities that parent used to do with that child, that, that can be a huge help. Yeah, absolutely. And then to, I believe it was your first question when they were talking about the, the power outages and the internet, which happens a lot here. Yeah. Um, I do know that they have some decent mobile hotspots um, that are working for families. We have some families who have individuals who are completely nonverbal and depend on their iPads. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you can't charge them, um, but they also need uh, their apps that they use often. So we there are quite a few mobile hotspots that seem to be working for families up here. So if the internet does go out, um, they still have another option. Great. All right. It is a problem. We've got a generator now portable, just have to have gasoline that hasn't been sitting for two years. <laughs> All right, folks, we'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jed. And we will, uh, we will talk to you next week. Good deal. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.